while you're sitting here in meditation, you're dropping all your other responsibilities in the world outside. But that doesn't mean you're being irresponsible. You're actually taking responsibility for your mind, where, the, where it goes, where it stays, what intentions you're going to follow, which ones you're going to put aside. You're not letting these things happen willy-nilly. When the Buddha talks about mindfulness as a governing principle, it's very telling that he doesn't describe it as simply watching things arising and passing away. He says if there's anything skillful that you haven't given rise to yet, you try to give rise to it. You're mindful to give rise to it. And once it's there, you're mindful to make sure it doesn't pass away. So we're not just passive observers. We're making choices, and we're responsible for those choices. The people who say that the Buddha taught no free will at all, I find it hard to see how they can make sense out of the teachings, because the Buddha is always talking about the choices you're making and how important they are. And how you need to learn to develop your attitude toward your actions as a skill. You may notice that you have some good intentions, but you can't leave them just as good. You have to test them to see if they're really skillful. When he started out teaching Rahula, he taught Rahula to look at his actions. Look at his intentions and look at the actions. If the intentions were good, you could follow through with them, and if the actions gave bad results, you take that as a lesson. What you thought was good was not. If they give good results, you can remember that too. Take that as a lesson as well. And adjust your actions accordingly. Take joy in when you are doing things right. And come down a little hard on yourself when you're, when you're making mistakes. But don't just come down hard. Learn from the mistakes and do your best not to repeat them. That's in the outside world. Then when the Buddha teaches some of his most advanced lessons on how to contemplate concentration or how to analyze your concentration in terms of its emptiness of disturbance, it's the, the same principle. You realize the disturbance is coming from your actions, what you're doing right now. And you learn how to drop whatever action it is that's causing the disturbance. So you get the mind into deeper and deeper levels of concentration as you get more and more sensitive to what at first seemed undisturbed, but after a while you begin to realize has a disturbance in it. So you're taking responsibility for the mind and trying to be more and more skillful, go beyond just good intentions, make them skillful. And develop the skills of concentration, develop the skills of mindfulness. Always take time to reflect. When things don't go well in the meditation, what are you doing? Is there something you can change? Don't just get upset by how bad the meditation is. Ask yourself, what am I doing? When the meditation goes well, let it go well. And as you come out, ask yourself, well, what did I do? If you're really mindful, you should be able to remember what you were doing up to the point where things began to settle in. So you can remember that and apply it the next time. So we're not here at a crapshoot, just taking whatever happens to come, trying our luck. Is, is our luck going to be good tonight or not good? We take things in hand. And the habits and the attitude that make you responsible as a meditator, they actually come from the outside, the way you act outside. The meditation and your daily life should inform each other, as in that principle where the Buddha is teaching Rahula, a basic principle simply about how to look at his actions. And then we find that it develops into a principle that's applied to the highest levels of meditation. The two areas are directly connected. The way you live your life is connected to the way you meditate. So you want to look carefully at how you live your life. Are you responsible?
This is one of the things that's really stressed in the forest tradition. Everybody in the monastery has to have a strong sense of appreciation that the things that they have at the monastery are all there given by somebody. They're all the result of someone's generosity, so you want to take good care of them. You always clean up after yourself. And if someone has neglected, to, someone else has neglected to clean up after him or herself, well, you clean up after them. And this way, if everyone helps one another, this way it becomes a much nicer place to live, and you develop good qualities. I found out after I'd been with the John Fung for a while, he'd made a comment one time when I first went to stay with him. Here was this strange Westerner coming in. He had no idea where I was, I was from. They said when told someone else one of the reasons he took me on was because I was always looking for things to clean up. If his spittoon was full, I'd take it out and empty it. If things were badly arranged, I'd arrange them. Well, sometimes I got into trouble because I arranged them in ways he didn't like. But at least I had the habit of wanting to be helpful. And he saw that as a quality he wanted to encourage. That was a quality that made him convinced, okay, this would be someone he could teach. So look at the way you go through your daily life. Are you cleaning up after yourself? Little things like that really do make a difference. You can't say, well, this kind of work is lowly and that kind of work is higher. Cleanliness is good wherever it is. Neatness is good wherever it is. And as you have this all-around attitude to being responsible for your surroundings, then when the time comes to sit down and meditate, you're going to be responsible for what's going on in your mind. And you begin to notice the little things. If you're not noticing little things outside, there's no way you're going to notice even the littler things that happen in the mind, little quick movements of the mind that are unintended, but reveal a lot about what's going on in deeper levels. So try to take a responsible attitude. We're living here, as I said, off the generosity of others. which means that we should take good care of their generosity. Make sure it stays in good shape, make sure it stays clean, neat. Because after all, you want to create a clean and neat mind. If your mind is a mess, how are you going to straighten things out? How are you going to even see what needs to be straightened out? And don't be afraid of being obsessive. Even though John Fung noticed that I was clean, he found ways in which I was not clean enough and by his standards. You're talking about how meticulous a John Mun was. He would take little rags that people had tossed away here and there and get them together and stitch them up and make a little cloth for wiping feet. In other words, nothing went wasted. Everything was kept clean. Even the rags for washing the feet, wiping the feet, were kept clean. Things that in most Thai households tend to be allowed to be dirty. He would make sure that everything was clean. If the junior monks weren't doing it, he'd do it himself. That set a good example. Because there is a quality of meditation that has to be a little bit obsessive, too. You have to keep looking and looking and looking to see where in the mind. Are you causing yourself suffering in ways you don't really have to? If you're not really meticulous about this, you'll miss everything. The little signs will be there, but you won't see them. And you wonder why your meditation isn't progressing. Well, you're not being sensitive enough. You're not paying careful attention enough. So try to develop that attitude of paying careful attention outside. This is one of the reasons why in the old days in the forest tradition, things were not all that explained. You had to look at what other people were doing. 
if you weren't sure to be done, well, watch when someone else there who has more experience is doing something like that. What are they, how do they do it? Observe. Learn to be observant. And you pick up a lot of unintended and unexpected lessons. Another comment that John Fu made when I first went to stay with him, to really practice with him. He said that every meditator has to think like a thief. When you're going to steal something from someone's house, you don't go up to them and ask, okay, where is this, where is that? Where do you keep your valuables? When are you going to be away so I can come into the house? How do I undo the lock? You have to observe things on your own. You can't expect everything to be handed to you on a platter. And John Mahabua talks about how that was a John Munn's attitude. A lot of things he just wouldn't explain because he didn't want you to get you used to the idea everything had to be handed to you. Everything had to be explained. He wanted you to figure things out on your own. That becomes one of your qualities and this ability to figure things out on your own. Be willing to test what you figured out so you can get a sense of when you've got it figured out right and when it's not. Then how you can make adjustments when it's not. You're taking responsibility for yourself. That's what the practice is all about. <laughs>